Okay, uh, it's a privilege to be in your midst and uh, to be here in Cluj. And uh, yeah, I'm now already for the fifth time here in Romania, and it's good to meet friends again uh, from the past. And uh, my name indeed is Wouter Droppers. I'm coming from the Netherlands. I'm married. I have two children. They are also married. Uh, I was in business for a long time, 24 years myself in automotive business. I was president of several companies. I started my professional career when I was 18 years old, reselling spare parts for automobiles. And when I was 28, I was part of the management team of that company. And we had 120 stores all over the Netherlands and uh, in Belgium. And I did marketing and purchasing at the end. Uh, then I moved to Volkswagen Audi. I became responsible for several dealerships, running several dealerships, leasing company, financing, body parts, the, the whole package. I did that for another six years and then I moved to one of the biggest resellers of cars in the Netherlands and became responsible for the Volvo and Range Rover brand within that company. In 2007 I became president of a, a business, Christian uh, Entrepreneurial uh, Association. In the Netherlands that is a, a full-grown, mature association where business people meet with each other in small groups are accountable to each other, and build each other, share knowledge, work together. Uh, and these small groups are also hubs of springs of well-being. They invest in society, they invest in, uh, in other things. And uh, yeah, that was a privilege to do. And since 2015, I work for Europartners. And Europartners is a European movement of Christian entrepreneurs and business leaders who are very intentional about living the faith in their business and in their leadership and would like to spread the gospel and share it with their peers and with their friends. So today what we're going to do is we look to biblical growth principles for successful business. And with that I would like to challenge your math you learned at school and your assumptions. Because if it works this should be our agenda. We're going to talk about one plus one is not two but more than three and how to achieve that by cooperation. We're going to talk about automatic growth mechanisms who you can implement in your company so that your company automatically grows and that's by changing culture. We also will challenge your math by the quote that 10 minus 5 is more than 10. And we will talk about redefining success. What is really business success? And where, how does it look like? So this is our challenge uh, this evening. And afterwards we will have a Q&A. Because we can imagine that when you see this you have some questions. Let us go to the first one. One plus one is more than three. Uh, talking about cooperation. We know that it's said that economy is a science about the division of limited means. But what would it be that economy could create abundancy and wealth for everyone? Often we look at business as a zero-sum game. When I win, someone else lose. Or when I become more prosperous, someone else has to suffer. But what if we can change that and don't look at business as a battle? Many business people look at business as a battle. I would like to take my part of the pie and at least uh, a, a bigger part or a much bigger part. But if we don't look at our competitors as an enemy, but as a potential partner in business, as someone we can invest with. Now, what are the principles of this cooperation to create wealth for everyone? And uh, one is there already there that many hands make the work lighter. We all know that. But there is more uh, in cooperation. And I think cooperation becomes stronger and the leverage of corporations become more and the benefits of cooperation becomes more if we start to work with specialists. The more we can specialize in our own field, in our own knowledge, in our own skills, in our own talents, the deeper we can go into a topic and if we bring all these specialists together, the higher the leverage and the benefit is. The more we differ, the more we can benefit. And uh, God wired us all in a very special way. We have all our talents. And too many times we limit ourselves because we want to be too broad to control everything in our life. But I would like to urge you to make use of your talents and to become a specialist. And I think there is a 
a lot benefit in uh, because if we can make use of each other's capacities and expertise, we can achieve more. And uh, you can do that to by becoming part of what I call an ecosystem. And an ecosystem is uh, a group of disciplines who hardly have any connection with each other, but they meet each other, they en encourage each other, they strengthen each other. And maybe a good example is the Dutch agriculture sector. You know, in the Netherlands, we are a very small and tiny nation. We are probably not bigger than one of your regions, or maybe smaller than one of your regions. But we are the second largest exporter of agriculture goods in the world. And how can it that such a small, tiny nation can export so many agriculture goods? And that has to do with cooperation. Because our farmers, they meet in small groups. They share knowledge. They share their expertise. They share with each other and they learn from each other. I think it was two decades ago that the Dutch government said we would like to yield or to, 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 to double uh, the yield of our agriculture goods. And how to do that? How to double the yield of your crop? And uh, in the Netherlands, they did that by working together. So government, university, science, IT, uh, other expertises, they started to work together on this project to double the yield within 20 years, and they were very successful. So we have a university, it's called Wageningen, and that's not a learning institute. No, it's a hub of innovation. The research and development departments of the big companies are there. Uh, they have uh, on the university square young students who have a startup and who start their own business. And they all cooperate and work together. They share knowledge, they share expertise, they hire each other, and uh, they add new disciplines to it. IT disciplines, uh, climate disciplines, and at the end they were able uh, to double the yield uh, of the agriculture sector. And I have a movie about that, so you will see it soon. So, in your own company, become also part of an ecosystem. Try to find partners who don't do the same as you do, but who have other disciplines, talk with them, and try what you can do to achieve more. Another benefit is by sharing risks, you can do bigger investments and achieve something you could not do on your own. So if you have big projects, if you would like to do something in a nation, if you would like to change the whole sector, you need to cooperate and then you can achieve much more. Now to give an impression about the Dutch agriculture sector and what we did, I have a small movie. Holland is pretty crowded. Our land is quite expensive, labor is expensive, so we have to be as efficient as possible. We have to be more efficient than others to compete, and that competition drives innovation and technology. We decided to go for not more hackers, but for more yield per hacker. That's the moment that we start looking into precision act, precision technology. A lot of people think it's science fiction, but it really is not. We have only 14 and a half hectares, and we're producing around 100 million tomatoes a year. The idea about this greenhouse is we even use less water, we use 50% less energy. <coughs> Our tomato plants grow in our reporting system, so we know for sure that everything is clean and we can steer everything very precisely. We use all the new techniques and all the innovations with a minimum impact on the environment. My definition of precision farming is doing the right thing on the right moment on the right place. Of course, we're more sustainable because we use less input and that's economically good for me. We use a range of technology. We are using soil scans that measure the soil quality and the availability for nutrients in the soil. And then the thermal cameras can detect diseases or water stress. 
implementing precision farming as a way of getting a better yield and a better quality. I still believe that farming is the job of the future. There will be more people, more amounts to feed, and less area. We have to expand the use of our food that much that we actually need the precision farming to do that. Sometimes sustainable solutions are costing a bit more on the short term, but on the long term they should be more effective. And that's actually what we see. You need to have the guts to invest in those kind of things for the long term. You have to know that most of these farms are run by small families, ordinary people, single people, who don't have all the knowledge in the house. But they were able to produce double, use 90% less water, have hardly any pesticides, build greenhouses in a design where they completely control the climate, where they control the coal uh, dioxide for growing the plants, and uh, that they are not uh, depend on the weather anymore. And they only could do this by working together, by cooperation. And uh, that's the strength of cooperation. But cooperation is also very fragile. Uh, you have some requirements, you have some rules who work. Uh, the individual needs to be willing to take the whole picture in account. These people don't cooperate to try to get their share out of the pie. They cooperate with a common purpose to serve the nation, to serve the sector, uh, to serve all the people. So that is imp it's very important that you are focused on the greater good and keeps in mind all the costs and all the benefits of all the stakeholders. Another thing that is important is that you share the values and that you share the same mind. It's very important that you have a clear direction where you want to go and that everyone gives his commitment. Another important thing is that there is a win-win, that the profits and the benefits for all the stakeholders are not equally shared, but shared to their responsibility, to the risk they take, to their part in the investment and in the cooperation, and that you honor that. That there is a mutuality, that there is always a win-win for all parties. And I think that is key in every cooperation. But that asks a different mentality, that asks a different way of thinking, that have a different way of approaching the market and thinking about wealth and wealth creation uh, in your nation, in your land and for yourself. And I think that makes it very fragile. You know that I also put here a scripture verse, uh, because we are here by Faith Guild, so I assume some of you are Christians. And also in the Bible, we see this uh, picture of cooperation. Uh, St. Paul used a metaphor of the human body. And you have to know that we are a person, we are a very complex organism. Uh, we have kidneys, we have lungs, we have eyes, we have ears, we, we have all kinds of different organs. But for some reason, they all work together. And because they all work together, we have a higher standard of living than, for example, the one cent one cell animals and many of us in business are the one cell animals we operate alone we have a very poor standard of living but what if we could all play our own part and our own unique role in a bigger system and live the whole system and the whole well-being of everyone but that requires that we also pay attention to the most, most fragile part of the cooperation uh, that we protect them, that they can still play their part uh, in the total of the cooperation. I think that is very important that we even the weakest person, that we don't use it, but that everyone is included. Another thing is that we need a strong leadership to foster and maintain a cooperation for growth, and that is justice and righteousness. And uh, yeah, that is, otherwise, uh, you know, a corporation can easily go into some kind of robber's game, that everyone takes his part out of it. And therefore, you need someone, a good leader, who controls it with justice and righteousness.
I think that is important. And what we also see, and it's also one of the benefits in cooperation, and you can see it around you, that high trust societies are more prosperous than low trust societies. And there we see a key, a key to unlock this cooperation, and that is trust. Cooperation is a system. But to feed the system, we need to trust each other. And trust requires a culture of trust. And that is the key to unlock this principle of growth and prosperity. And how then to work on a, on a culture of trust? Because I can try to implement the strategy, but I think it's Peter Drucker who said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Now we work together with your partners with Coca-Cola Consolidated. And their CEO, Frank Harrison, said, culture doesn't eat only strategy for breakfast, culture eats everything. And when you don't change the culture, you cannot change the company. You cannot change anything in society, you cannot change anything in your company. Culture is key. And I think that's very important to understand. Because out of culture follows everything. And this is a big company. It is a company with 16,000 employees who serve 20% of the American population and they are in bottling. So they bottle all the Coca-Cola bottles and all the, uh, the other soft drinks uh, that Coca-Cola produce. And their motto is build first culture and everything will follow from it. And I think that is true. And I think that's also in, in the Bible. In the Bible, there is a phrase in Matthew 7, verse 33, where Jesus say, Seek first the kingdom and its righteousness and its principles, and all the rest will flow from it. And that's the same with culture. If we start to build a kingdom culture in our companies, imagine that you have a company where integrity, honesty is normal, where you work on excellence, where you work with consistency, where you work on quality, where you serve your clients with love and with passion. Imagine that that culture is in your company. How would that change your company? How would that change your performance in the market? What will your clients tell about you when you do that? I visited two companies already in this week, and these two companies could not explain their uh, fast amount of growth because they were not distinguishing themselves on finances, in the assortment, in the products from their competitors. And when I asked them, why do you grow? And why do you grow faster than your competitors? They couldn't answer. But when I talk with their managers and with the people, I know the answer. They had a different culture. And the clients, they, 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 they tasted it. And because they have a different cultures, they get different employees. Because they care for their employees and they have a different culture in the company, all the high potentials in that area would like to work in that company. And when they work in that company, they only, not only work there for a paycheck, they work in the company because they feel ownership with the company. They are engaged in the purpose of the company. They believe in what the company believes. So they work there with their soul, with their heart, with their blood, sweat and tears. And then you get someone who's completely different. So I think it's important to address culture. And uh, in the Bible, I put there Psalm 101. You see, that's the song of David. And David is also singing about culture. Eh? What he is literally saying, he said, uh, let me see what he, if I can find it. I cannot. Oh, yeah, it's not a touch screen. Sorry. <laughs> so used to touch screens. Uh, yeah. He wants to... Uh, that love and justice as a trademark and an example, uh, and that what he he's praising just and love is love in his palace, and he don't want to be gossip in his palace. He don't want people who slander other people. He tried to transform them. He tried to get rid of it. So he's very strict on culture, and that brought him uh, more. So culture is everything. How to change your culture? Because if you start to understand that trust is important to foster cooperation and that culture is be done, so how to change your culture in your company? I think it all starts with the leader. The leader should walk the talk. And when the leader doesn't do it, it will fail. 
It's all about you as leaders. And when you don't do it, it will not work. It is so important that you are an example of trust, that you create trust, that you are an example of integrity, that you walk the talk in your company. Because everyone look at you. Everyone would like to glorify it by you, would like to receive your, your favor. So what they do, what do employees with the leader? They copy the leader. They try to get the favor of the leader. So when you start to be corrupt, when you start to take shortcuts, when you gossip about people, they will do. Because they look for your reward. So it's very important that you do what you talk about. Know your purpose, your values and your goals. And not only know them, but put them to paper and communicate them. But even more, live them. And live them very consistent. Even, on the, yeah, even when you lose money with it. Or you have to suffer for it. It's so important that you live what you preach and that you put that to paper. Uh, if we talk about this uh, Coca-Cola company, they said, we live there to honor God in everything we do. Imagine that that is the phrase in your company. That's very, you make yourself very vulnerable. That you said everything we do for the honor of God. And the, in Coca-Cola it said, that's what we want to be. We want to be vulnerable. We want the people to come to us if we cheat on this. If we don't do it. If they say, oh, somewhere is happening here. I thought you were Christians and now this is going wrong. They want them to stand up, to come to them to accuse them, to talk with them, and so that they can improve. Because that's not what they want to be. Eh? And out of that, they said, we would like to serve others. And we would like to serve them with excellence, to pursue excellence, and to grow profitably. And they said, we do it for good, for God, and for growth. So they're very down to earth as well. Eh? well. You need to make money in your business. They also have a a program, they look for the person beyond the employee and beyond the client. So they don't see you as an employee or staff, then you can easily be transformed in costs or production uh, means or uh, a means to an end. And they said, we would like to see the person beyond it. So what they have, they have mentoring programs. You can follow courses. You can follow courses in that company to develop yourself but also to develop your family life. And when you have problems, you can go to a local pastor. They have a chaplaincy program in the company. You can talk with someone because they know if your marriage is right, if you are stable in your emotional life, if you are stable in your normal private life, then you perform better. They have a rapid response team because they are on the East Coast and many times you have the hurricanes. And when uh, family houses are destroyed, they have a rapid response teams to help the families, to help the society, to rebuild the society. They have a generosity program where staff and employees can uh, apply for good charities or where they feel connected to in the local society or in, uh, in other things. And when they approve a project, they will double everything that is paid by the staff or the employees. They care for the people. And because they know that it has cared for them, these people work in another way within that company. And I think that is key to develop this culture and to live it and to make it personal. They offer a lot of support tools. When you start to implement these steps, trust yourself that it is already given to you and implement it well. And what do I mean by that? Uh, don't stop when you fail, because you will be disappointed. They will be cheated on you. You will pay a price for it. And maybe and people will test the system, and they will test you if it is true or not. So stand, implement it, do it well, live it, and you will see a change on the long term. As these farmers said, we live for the long term. Uh, don't overestimate what you can do in one year, but don't underestimate what you can do in five or six years. So stand, keep to it, change your culture, change your company. Uh, 
Another thing what I would like to challenge you with is 10 minus 5 is more than 10. And 10 minus 5 is more than 10 is the principle of sharing is multiplication. And maybe you said, how does that work? Now, it works very easy. You, you know how it works, actually, because uh, many of you have maybe a farmer background, or we saw this farmer, you put one grain in the soil, you saw, you share, and automatically it grows and it multiplies. It's the same with intangible values. If I start to share love with you, love will grow in my heart, love will grow in your heart, you will see the reward of it, you will share it among society, and love will grow in society. Same with hatred and with gossip. If you start to hate people, hate will grow in your life and in society. So everything you share will be multiplied. It's the same with talents and skills. If you are a carpenter and you are a student, and you practice, and you practice, and you do more, you produce, and these products, they go into the market, and you produce better and better because your skills develop, and you become a real craftsman. So even with, with craft it's, and skills, it's the same with knowledge. If we start to share knowledge, knowledge grows. Eh? I build on the knowledge of someone else, I ask his input, and we build on each other's knowledge, and knowledge is growing in society, and knowledge is growing everywhere. So everything we share will be multiplied. That's automatic biblical principle. And then people say to me, ah, but money, money is different. Ah, money, it seems like mad, you know, I have $10, and when I uh, take away $5, maybe I have $5 left. It's not true. Only when we bury more money in the ground, it will not multiply. But if we start to invest money in businesses, in people, in uh, entrepreneurship, in endeavors, money is growing. And actually, this is one of our tasks. The Bible speaks about this in Matthew 25, the, the, the parable of the talents. Yeah. Everyone receives something. You receive good brains, you receive a strong body, you receive talents, you receive skills, you receive opportunities. And then Jesus say, please put them into practice. Go in business, do something with it, take risk, make them happen, and multiply them. And they multiply. And only the one who bears is not multiplied. And when you are in finances, I would like to urge you, don't go in crypto money. Because you're only multiplying money. But that's not multiplying fruit. It's not creating fruit. And I think it's important in the kingdom that you create <coughs> fruit and that you not accumulate only money. Now, is crypto money currently a bad business? I don't advise you to go in. But it's the same with the stock exchange. Don't put your money in the stock exchange. But put your money in companies. Put your money in persons. Put your money in the real economy where it can bear fruit, where it can work, where it bears fruit in employment for people, in new companies, in, uh, in, in building the society, in, in, in creating work, in, in making people flourish. Uh, invest it well. So even when you invest money, it multiplies in various ways. It multiplies in money, but it multiplies in social wealth. It can multiply in spiritual wealth. It can multiply on all kinds of different ways. But that depends where you invest it. Therefore, invest it well and invest it in the normal economy. And then I would like to talk with you, because many of you are Christians, about the, the miracle of generosity. You know, if we start money to give money away, there is some miracle that God is saying, I will bless that. If you start to give money away to get blessed, then probably you are on the wrong side. I know of a friend, and uh, he had multiple companies and said, now I start a company and all the profits from this company, they are for God. And this company was not taking off. And he put more money in and more money in and three years of losses. And then he cried out to God, said, God, all my companies make profit, but this company for you is not profit. What's going wrong? And then God was saying to him, do you think I need your money? I, the one who gave it all? I the one who created earth and all the prosperity and all the West Bank. Do you really that I am God who is in need and need your money? God doesn't need our money. So don't use it that God is in need. Don't use it as a principle to get rich yourself. But God wants our heart. Use it to love people, to take care for people, because you are touched by it. And when you become generous in that way, then you will see that God will pay or in this life or in the afterlife. In Malachi 3, God is telling, test me, 
test me if I would not be generous and, and, and giving you if you become generous for others. And a very good story of that is a, is a friend of mine. He lives in Latvia and he sells mobile phones. And uh, two years of COVID didn't do good to his business. So he was in lack of cash flow. And uh, he was basically living on the credit line of his creditors, of his suppliers. And he couldn't pay in time anymore. So the suppliers started to call him. And he was in, in big trouble. But still he had some money left. And then the war started in the Ukraine. And he knew about his childhood, how when he was poor and when he had hungry and what it is to be a refugee. And he decided, he decided to give his last money of his company away for the refugees in the Ukraine. And in the same way he did that, he received a call from his biggest supplier and said, why are you not paying me? He said, I give my money away to the Ukraine. I'm lacking cash flow. I had bad times with COVID. And that's the case. And I can only ask you to, to have more patience. And this guy was so impressed by what he did that over the whole turnover, he received a refund of 20,000 euros in that week back. In the same week, he received a big order of 200 iPads. And at the end of the week, something happened. A Ukraine colleague of him, who was also in mobile phones, because of the war, he could not sell his stock anymore. But before the war, he had brought his whole stock to Poland. And this stock was, I think, six months turnover, six months of sales. And this guy said, I cannot sell my stock anymore. Would you like to sell it for me? You don't have to pay upfront, sell it for me, and then you pay me. And he had sales for six months. Not every adventure works in that way. But I can you tell you many, sto many stories about the miracle of generosity. When we start to give, that God shows up in a miracle way. So, sharing is multiplication. Another thing of sharing is multiplication is this phrase. This phrase what we use in Europe partners. Making money is killing your business. And then many people will say to me, well, Wouter, is not all business about making money? Isn't that, that the goal of business? No, it's not the goal of business. If you start to focus on making money, you will lose the focus on your business. Because the business what you have is to serve the client well, is to fulfill the needs of the client. And when you focus on the need of the client, you become more excellent because you want to improve, you want to do your service better, you want to serve your client better. But if you start to focus on money, you start to see your client as an ATM machine or profit. And then you see, start to see your service or your, your product as costs. And you try to make cost savings because you want to increase your profit. So you are not working on excellence. You're not working on improving your business. Now you're even downgrading your business because you would like to make money. And slowly your company is going down. And when you start to focus on money, you are not focused on solving needs anymore, on serving and loving people and your clients anymore and slowly your business goes down. So, multiplication is sharing and focus on the good things of multiplication. To make this change is asking a new heart. To make this change is asking a new culture. And why is it asking a new heart? Because everything in life starts from the heart, as this phrase is saying. In your heart is that what you worship and treasure. But what you worship and treasure defines your acts and your deeds and what you do. But what you do defines your destiny. So it all starts in the heart. And it's, I think for that reason that Selman is saying, of everything you treasure, guard the most of your heart because there are the sources of life. Out of your heart starts to spring everything. So when you are focused and you treasure worship and money, you treasure glory, you treasure status, probably that will be your end. But what then do you have? Uh, you work on that. And I think if we would like to change the culture, if we would like to build trust, if we would like to work with cooperation, if we believe that multi sharing is multiplication, we need to change our heart and our thinking. And let me give you a personal story to end with it. 
I know as no one else what it is to become rich, to work for money, to work for glory. I think the first years of my life was just proving myself to my parents, uh, to my environment, that I could become a good business guy. And I made a lot of money. And I was in this company reselling spare parts. And uh, I moved to another position. And I was 28. I was emotional, not completely in balance. And I was so eager to score that I uh, crossed some borders. And I had to leave the company. Then I worked with Volkswagen Audi. And then again, I was very successful. I became the love darling of the company. And people would like to partner up with you. And, and slowly, I was having this success. Uh, I, now, at one evening, I came home. And my wife, I met my wife and she said, Wouter, when you maintain in this behavior, probably we will get divorced. And I didn't know what she was talking about because I was a Christian. I go to church. I give money away. We did social business. So basically, I did everything what was necessary. We had good vacations. We had a nice house, nice car. Everything was there. So I asked her, what is the problem? She said, the problem is that you don't care about me anymore. I said, what do you mean? You receive the car with your birthday, we go on nice vacations, you can buy everything. So what's the problem? Mm -hmm. said, so the problem is you don't see me anymore. When you enter the room, the room is filled with your personality. And you don't spend any time and any attention to me anymore. And when I started to realize that and to think it through, I recognized that in the start of our marriage, I loved her because who she was. And in that time in, li in life, I only loved her because what she was giving to me. Nice home, good upbringing for the children, representative lady, good sex, uh, a, a, a place to be and, and to be indulged and, and spoiled. But not for who she was. I was never asking how her day was or what she had done that day. And then I realized that all my relationships were changed. And as I told you, clients were ATM machines or profit, uh, employees were cost or production means, friends were a good time. And then I realized that I was losing all my relationships that life was only about me, myself, and I, and that I became lonely, and that I became empty, and that I maybe had all the money and go on vacations. But what do you have when you have all the money and you are on an island on your own with all the money and all the luxury you can have and can buy? You're losing life. And that helped me to understand life more, that life is not about making money or being successful in business, but that the core of life is loving relationships that you are able to love someone and that someone is able to love you and that you allow him or her to love you. That you are able to know someone to its deepest core fully with all the downsides and with all the dark sides, but that you still can love him or her. And that you enable someone to know you. And I think there is where success in life is about. And that you can also live that in business. Imagine that you can know your client fully and that he is able to know you fully and that he know that sometimes your performance may be less, but nevertheless, he stays loyal, he loves you and you love him. And that you together try to improve and to move forward in this cooperation and this relationship and help each other and grow forward. What would that change? What would it change in your relationship if you know that you are fully known but that your partner also fully loves you. You know, the sad thing is that I was talking with uh, a lady, I think she was in her 30s, and that she said, oh, I share my life with this group of people, I share my emotional life, and with this group of people, I share my spiritual life, and with this group of people, I share my business life, and with this group of people, I share... I said, that's nice, that's good, I do as well, you, you don't expose yourself to everyone. But then the remark afterwards, because, as she said, imagine that someone would know me fully, then probably they will not love me anymore. And that made me cry. That we live in a society where you cannot be known because you are afraid that people will not love you anymore. How poor is that life. And then to know that we have a God who knows us fully, all our dark sides, all our failures, all our wrongdoings, 
and still says, I love you completely, unconditional, and nothing can come in between that love. How is that freeing yourself? That you don't have to be ashamed, that you don't have to feel guilty, that you don't feel any judgment, that people are not watching you to observe your performance, or that you are your latest success and you need to score a new success to be acceptable for the people or acceptable for your boss, but that they still love you. I think there is the core of life. And we should redefine success into loving relationships. That we are able to love our people, that we are able to love our staff, that we are able to love our clients and to love our suppliers. And when they mistake, make mistakes, that we come there and we would like to know them. Why is it and what is going on? And I will close with the last story of a good friend of mine. She was in the food and she had a supplier for already 20, 30 years. Her father worked with this supplier and the supplier, her father also worked, they worked for already for a long time together. But the quality was going down. And the purchasing team in that company said, we should get rid of this supplier. So they were looking for alternatives. They had alternatives in place. And they came to the boss and said, we will stop with the supplier. He said, why do you stop with this loyal supplier? He's already a supplier for 25 years. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't perform well. Packaging is not good. Every time falls, we called many times. We did improvement programs. Nothing changed. So we stop and we will take, we already have others and we will check. And now that's not the way I operate. So she went, she was a female director, to this supplier and was looking in the company and was talking. We have a relationship for more than 25 years. How is it going? And she saw that in the packaging department there was a machine that didn't function well. And uh, they came there and said, you know, we have troubles and uh, they would like to, to skip you as our supplier. And I see your packaging machine is not good working. so. Well, what is the problem? And then the supplier started to cry. He said, my father passed away. Now my brothers and sisters were their part of the company. I have to pay them out. And currently I cannot do the investment to, to replace this machine for packaging. And then touched her. And she said, I will finance. I will give you a loan to replace this machine. And what is the benefit? The benefit she saved the supplier. She bought the engagement and the ownership of the supplier for a life loan. She gave him a loan. She got a good interest rate. So she received money also from that loan and made money for that. She can maintain everything she does. And she brought life into the whole situation. And the whole purchasing department was amazed that she was doing that. And therefore she gave a witness of her faith. So on all the levels, she was creating wealth and life. And I think that is our challenge. And it can be done very easily by just changing your heart. And when you change your heart and your thinking, you will change your deeds and you will change the destiny, not only of yourself, but also from your company and this nation. Thank you. We have time for a Q&A. I can imagine that there are questions, maybe questions of your personal life, maybe questions of your company, maybe questions about this topic. Please feel free. Bogdan can translate. How have you done to organize the time when you had a small business and a small business, in case you had a business when you had a small business? How did you manage to organize your time when uh, you had your business and you had also small children? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I, I had it easy. You know, my wife was not working. She was staying at home with the traditional roles, what you probably not have anymore. Uh, so for me, it was easy. I had a very lovely wife. She granted me my work. She granted me my business. She granted me my time. And as long as I put attention to her, uh, she was very satisfied. So what crucial was for her was not the amount of time we spent together, but that she had the feeling I really cared about her. So that when I was at home, was asking about her life and not eating my food, planning the other meeting, watching my phone, doing an email, telling my story and not asking her anything. But when she saw that I care about her, 
that I called, for example, in the car. Oh, you had a difficult day, or, or well, how is it with the children, or what happened, or uh, and she tells a story, and I remember the story. I come in and I asked to it, that enabled me to do my job. So when she saw that she was the most important person for me, I could even spend more time on my work. But she had that feeling that when it was crucial and that I really cared about her. And nowadays it's difficult because most time mo both partners work. Now what you see in the Netherlands, what my children do, they're also married and they are working both. They work part time, they work only for four days. So they have a day off and then they can take for the children and another day off and my wife is taking care of the children and they, two days they go to a, a, a kindergarten. Uh, but in that phase of life, yeah, it's busy. It, it, that, that, that is true, but you are still full of energy and you are young and uh, you can face reality and probably you will love it, and, but it's busy. It's, it's not easy, yeah. But spent what we did when we had children and I was busy, we always had one evening that was for the two of us. So uh, one evening, when the kinder was small, uh, one evening, I did not work for the company, that was our evening. Thursday evening was our evening, and, and the weekends was also for the family. So I did not work on Sunday, I tried to minimize, minimize work on Saturday, and Thursday was always our, our special evening, where we played games, we go out for dinner, we go to theater, we did something together what we liked. And uh, when the children became older, we uh, had a nanny who took care of the children that evening and we paid her and uh, we could maintain that habit. That helped us a lot, but that will not solve everything. I think that the core is that she can feel or he can feel in his heart, he or she really loves me, he cares about me. Even when he comes home, he, has a, he knows where I am or would like to know where I am. He would like to get to know me, you know, what we talked about, to get to be known. That is so important that you that you are seen, that you are known. That is that makes everything. Um, thank you for your message, for your input. I uh, just wanted to go back to the setting the culture uh, within your business. Um, so my question is: Can you know every business has you know different? They can set uh, within their business a different culture. Um, can different cultures? interfere with cooperation? Yes, sure. If someone is in the cooperation only for money and another one wants to achieve something, and then you have a different culture. It can be balanced if there is a win-win. So that the one who is in there only for the money keeps his money and his benefits going. Eh? As uh, the, the person was asking, do you need values to be in a corporation? And sometimes a corporation just pays. And, uh, and that is good. But when you start to get only your part of the pie, then uh, the others will probably get upset over time because they see always this egocentric uh, tendency in your, in your work, in the way you uh, act. Uh, if there is a di new discussion about a new investment or uh, making new costs and cost go before the yield, that this person always start to protest, I don't want to go there and that's too much money and why should we do it and I'm already satisfied because I make enough money and why should we go in this new endeavor. There you see a collide of cultures. And there you see where someone who is in there only for himself and where the rest of the group is in there for the purpose of the corporation. I think always agree on the purpose and on the values. That is, that's crucial. Thank you very much for being also vulnerable and uh, sharing from your heart. Uh, I have a question. Uh, how do you cultivate your faith? Or how, what are some practices uh, from your relationship with God? And if you share your faith with uh, business partners, with clients, with uh, so in the work area, and how how do you do it? Uh, first, cultivate my faith. For me, uh, I wake up at six o'clock in the morning. Then I have my private time with God. I have my own space in my house where I can go to. I have the fortune, you know, my children are away, so I have my own library. I can sit there. I can pray there. I can read there. What do I do in this in this morning from six o'clock? Then I review the, for, the, the day before. Are there uh, some loose ends? Did I uh, make some mistakes? Did I value everyone? Uh, are there some action points left? Uh, what happened that day? 
And I pray through that day. I'm grateful for that day. I praise God for that day. And I take the action points or I put them to paper so that I can work on that. Then I uh, start to read something from the scripture. And, uh, and then I pray through this Bible first. What is it telling me? Uh, what does God want to tell me in this Bible first? How can I apply it to my daily life? And I pray for it. And then I start to look at my agenda for the coming day. What are the appointments I have? And I pray for the appointments and the meetings I have uh, the coming day. So that's the, and most times when I uh, have this time of reflection, because I think that is the word of it, that you, you, uh, you take yourself out of all your busyness and all your stress and all your hectic, and you look to your own life from a different level. That's basically what you do. You take time to reflect on your life from a different angle and from a different level. And I think that is very rewarding because most time you get drawn in, in all the hectics and all the agenda and all the speed. And, and, and like you're running in the forest and you don't know the way out anymore. And then you would have to have a drone that you could see the pathway, how to go out. And that's basically what you do in, in that morning. You, you withdraw yourself from all the hectic and you start to to go up and to look from a different angle at your life. And, uh, and there you, in the Bible, uh, and by praying, you remember the values and what you admire, and you said, do I live by it, etc. That's, that's basically what you do. So that's how I maintain my personal relationship with God. Then I also go sometimes in a retreat. I have a group of business people who I meet every 40 days. I meet a group of small group of friends. We share life, we pray together, we talk about business, we are accountable to each other, we keep each other on the track, uh, we share where we are vulnerable, and, and they give advice, uh, ask and unask. And uh, I think it's important to be part of a community, a smaller group, where you can be accountable to, and uh, that also built my life tremendously. And then I have a personal coach. I always ask someone to coach me. Or someone I speak with every month, and I have two friends I speak with three times a year. And I ask them and I, I look for them. I just changed uh, 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 one entrepreneur for another one. So I look to someone who I really value, who I really see as a role model, and I ask him, would you ask me all the questions you have for me uh, three times a year? And they start asking me questions about my life, about my marriage, about my business. And because they, I only see them three times a year, they have different angles, they look from a different perspective, they are not connected to my business, so I receive advice from them. I do the same with others. I also mentor young people, and I receive their knowledge, and I receive their world, and where they live. And they think I mentor them, but I learn a lot from them, how they view life, how they work, how they operate, and, and, and where their challenges are. And, and these kind of sharing, generosity, having personal time with God, reflect on your own behavior, I think that is key. Self-leadership, I call it, that is key. And the acronym for good self-leadership is being fed. It's called being faithful, being accountable, and being teachable. And when you have these three things in your life and you stick to that, that really builds your life. And then you had another question that was? About sharing the faith. Oh, sharing the faith. Yeah. Uh, people know that I am Christian. But it's not that I shout it from the mountaintops. It's not that in every talk I talk about Christianity. Uh, people know it. And uh, most times it comes very natural. Uh, in my uh, business life, after five o'clock, when business was done, the door was open, people just came in my room, asked questions, shared life, told, oh, hey, Walter, I know you are a Christian, but you know, you had to know my father. He always beat me. Now, when he's a Christian, I will never become a Christian. Or someone else said, oh, what you have to know, my wife is pregnant. Oh, and now I receive a child and I never believe in God. But I think well, maybe, maybe there is a God. And, and you share life. Or you have a, a business dinner with an entrepreneur and you pray for the dinner. I said, hey, are you a Christian? I never knew. Ah, that, that could be. And, and tell me, why are you a Christian? And people are curious. We live in a time that people are curious and that they would like to know, why are you doing this? You seem to be a normal person. Eh? <laughs> But you are also a Christian. <laughs> so what is wrong? <laughs> and they want to know. And, uh, and we are the ambassadors of God in the marketplace. You know, non-Christians are done with church. They are done with priests. They are done with religion. They are done with all the statements. They are done with all the judgment. They are done with all the opinions and the doctrines. And they would like to meet just ordinary people. 
and asking themselves, I see you have something. I see you are a Christian. Why is that? And then you can have an honest conversation. And don't try to evangelize people. Just share your life. Share what you treasure. Share what you value. And that's enough. And the Holy Spirit will do the rest. I'd like to go back a little bit to the um, generosity speaking. You have been talking about putting your resources at risk. And I must say that I am struggling with this because uh, I'm in search of some control points. I'm wondering if you have some advice regarding this. When it's too much, when is this affecting your family, putting your resources at risk? When do you say, okay, now it's enough and I need to stop because I'd like to care about my employees, I'd like to care about my customers, but then when do I stop? Uh, when do you stop in which kind of situation? Well, what do you mean by when do I stop? Putting my resources at risk. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I assume that before uh, you have a number of resources and one part of the resources you dedicate to your company, another part you dedicate to your pension or your future, another part you dedicate to your family, and you agree with your partner about where you dedicate it to or with your management team. So your resources are already limited by the purpose you give them. So what do you mean by when I cross the borders. So I'm wondering if when the resources that are dedicated to the business are almost finished, do you go beyond that? Oh, okay. So when you or? face bankruptcy, is that what you're asking or facing that you... Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, uh, the a tendency that entrepreneurs have is that he's always believe in himself <laughs> and he always believe in his business model. <laughs> and he has always the tendency to invest more because he believes that it will work. But showing that your business is going down, you're losing cash flow, you're losing resources, is you can also interpret it as a megaphone from God. You are in the wrong direction. <laughs> you are losing money. You do something wrong. Change your habits. <laughs> Change your behavior. <laughs> Look for another business. This, what you now do, will not continue for long anymore. So when you see that happening and you're running out of resources, you do something wrong. And you have to ask friends, advisors, counselors, come to me, look at my business. What is going wrong? What is wrong with my earning model? What is wrong with my business model? Why I'm losing money? And they can help you and point the weak spots. Because most times you don't see it yourself because you started this business with this idea that it was successful. And you believe in it and you should believe in it or otherwise your business will not take off. So you know that is your limitation, your fast and strong conviction that you are successful and that you can do it. And then you need someone else to tell you otherwise. And that is sometimes a struggle because that's a hard message to give. But if your business goes down, and you have to put resources in it, and you're running out of resources, uh, then something you do, you don't do good. Because a business should be profitable and should flourish. And when that is for one year not the case, and you can carry it, no problem. But even then you should repair. And even when your business is really taking off, you should improve and repair. Because you will always see that sometimes there's a competitor you did not expect and he improved his business, and when you don't do it, you are too late. So always try to repair. And these are signs, this is not failure. Many people take a bankruptcy or a lack of cash flow or business going down as a failure. No, it's a God-given grace call that God shows you, hey, you already see it. You're losing money. Change your behavior, change your business, change your earning model. Ask advice. Something is not going good. So it's not a, a failure. It's the megaphone of God that shows you that you're on the wrong path and you should change something. Hello, thank you for your presentation. Um, I want to ask you a question. Who um, is asking the question? I don't see. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're most likely facing a pretty bad. Uh, um, economic recession for the foreseeable future um, because of the high inflation and 
purchasing power is going down everywhere around the European Union and in the States. What uh, are some um, advice that you, you can give entrepreneurs for the next uh, uh, foreseeable future if or when the recession comes, the, the next recession comes? Nah, yeah, you know, uh, maybe recession is not that bad because we cannot keep up with growing. We have a scarcity of labor, we have a scarcity of resources. So there should be a, be a stop on the economical growth because we cannot manage to grow currently. Uh, we have too much money and so we're happy that it stops and that the interest rates grow. We have uh, no labor, we have a scarcity of labor, we have hardly any unemployment, so we cannot get the craft and the good people. So it could also be a blessing that it slows a little down. And you, you cannot foresee the future. So uh, uh, there, there's, uh, you have to know that the interest rates grow. Uh, within the coming five, six years, interest rate will grow. So build down your debts, build down your loans, because probably in the future you cannot pay them anymore or they will burden you too much. Oh, that would be a good advice. And then uh, just prepare for the future. So when you know a recession is coming, don't take too many risks if you think that is playing a part in your industry. So be moderate, make some savings, <coughs> diverse your money in other sectors. Uh, be careful. That's the only advice I can give. But no, we cannot predict the future. As we cannot predict a recession, we cannot predict growth. Most times it happened suddenly. And uh, therefore, it's always important to have manageable risks, low risk, have good employees who are, have their own, uh, who are motivated, who live in your culture, who can make their own decisions, who are dedicated to you. So have good employees. Be part of an ecosystem that you can innovate in time. And uh, the last thing is to, to build an organization where uh, the decisions you can make in a lower level so that you are agile and flexible. I think that, that, that is important. Uh, yeah, that, that's the only thing uh, I can give you. Uh, you know, we live in a FUCA society, they call it. It's highly volatile, uncertain, complex, and big issues. And uh, in a volatile society, where everything goes up, you need to have a clear focus where you want to go. So purpose, what is your purpose? Where do you live for? Why do you have your business? It's very important. In a very uncertain society, where you don't know what the future brings, you need to know what you want to, to build. Because that helps you in keeping yourself on, on the path. In a very complex society, where you don't know what everything will happen, you need to make love as your driver because you cannot respond to everything that is going. So your values are important, that you stick and keep course by your values. That gives you some kind of resilience. So having manageable debts, having good employees who can make their own decisions, uh, be part of an ecosystem that you can innovate and that you can change. So that is the ability to be agile and to create a strong identity in your purpose and your values and uh, why you live and do your business. And I think when you have those both things in place, you can manage many recessions. Uh, you, told us that, you told us that in the Netherlands there's a lot of uh, family businesses and I lived in the Netherlands and I can agree with you. And I worked together with my father too, uh, but we are so different. Uh, we have some different behaviors. I'm, all the, I'm on a new way trying to improve our business with technology and he's on, on an old way. Uh, sometimes he's not according with the Bible too, doing background things, trying to avoid the taxes and I work together with him. What can I do? Yeah. <laughs> it's a very classical story and I don't have an answer. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that happens many times and uh, I love him as much as you can and try to, to talk with him and, uh, and when you really cannot carry it anymore, maybe you make your own paths or you find your own rules, but uh, it is hard because all kinds of things get mixed up. Loyalty to your parents, uh, love for your parents, 
the pain for failure. You see things coming down. He's from the old style. You know where to head for. Uh, he doesn't give you the authority and the freedom to, to, to develop yourself. Uh, yeah, it happens. That, that there is no easy solution. That is a very classical. You know, working together in marriages, in, in, in families, that the divorce rate is not for nothing that high. We, we human beings, we find it hard to to find a way to cooperate and to set ourselves apart or to choose the lower position or, or to help someone grow. Therefore, is this transformation of culture and the heart so important? That you are not living for yourself, but that you live to, to make others flourish. And when you don't have that perspective, in, not in your marriage and not in a cooperation, yeah, then easily things go, go down. And there's only one enemy who would like to bring you down, and, and that is that's our enemy would like to destroy all the relationships. And uh, because relationships are the core of life, loving relationships, there is where everything starts, where everything flourishes. And sometimes we are not able to live it well and, and, and to do it well. And that's a sad thing to do. And that, that really touched me. But yeah, try to respect someone else, love someone else, talk with each other, try to know each other. What is there beyond? Try to make yourself known to him. What is beyond your... Uh, when you have a role and, and you fight each other, what is beyond that? Why are you responding this way? Talk with each other, try to do it. Respect each other, make each other flourish. Respect him as well in his... He comes from an upbringing. He has his own past. He has his own pain. He has his own wounds. Uh, and probably you are aware of it. And, uh, and try to address that and say that. I know you are struggling with this. I know this is not your cup of tea. I know you have a different past, but you know, I also have a future. And you will know that you need a future. And, uh, and try to connect on heart level and win the battle there. And not in technique or in technology or what you should do in the company. Because if you can win his heart, you will win your future. But it's not easy. And there is no predictable outcome. It depends also on him. There always needs two to, to dance a tango. But I wish you all the best yeah. and success. Yeah. Uh, și în aceste ultime minute vreau să chem alături de mine pe Ruben Marian. Este cel care uh, împreună cu Daniel au uh, fondat Guild și au dus lucrurile mai departe și mai departe și mai departe. Uh, și vreau să ne zie câteva cuvinte despre Guild Fate. Până aproximativ 5 ani în urmă, prin 2017, eram super pasionat de business. Businessul era preocuparea mea principală. De dimineața până seara eram în business, minim 12-14 ore pe zi, pentru că dezvoltând afacerea antreprenoriale în România, împreună cu soția mea, Oana, am crezut că asta e modelul. Trebuie să-i recuperăm pe olandez și ce-au făcut ei în 200 de ani, poate reușim și noi în vreo 20. Și asta era toată pasiunea mea. Însă, cu toate că businessul e o platformă care te poate face să te simți important, îți dă o scenă, poți să te compari cu alții, poți să verifici cifrele de afaceri și numărul de angajați și ai ce să povestești când ieși la o cafea, cu toate astea nu eram foarte, foarte fericit de doar implicarea în business. Și tot timpul mi-am dorit să fie ceva mai mult, am crezut că poate să fie ceva mai mult și... Așa a, a venit uh, um, ideea uh, Guild la, un, uh, um, la o discuție împreună cu Daniel uh, Lar. Uh, Ne-am pus întrebarea cum am putea să uh, contribuim la uh, o schimbare pozitivă în societate și prin ceea ce facem să fim o influență pozitivă în jurul nostru. E greu să facem schimbare de sus în jos în politică în România, dar am putea să facem o schimbare în dreptul nostru. Și cum, cum ar fi dacă ceea ce noi ne-am dorit să se întâmple, să putem împărtăși cu alți oameni și schimbarea asta se înceapă de la noi. Și asta a fost ideea de bază, să începem să ne întâlnim cu alți oameni care încep să gândească diferit. Și ne-am dat seama că Există oameni care gândesc diferit, există oameni care acționează diferit, care au valori și principii diferite și cu care am putea să facem echipă. Așa au luat naștere mic dejunurile de la Guild. Guild vine de la 
cuvântul breaslă în limba engleză și e exact cum erau mai demult în Transilvania breslele. Breslele firarilor, pantofarilor, fiecare breaslă avea o nișă specifică și aveau lucruri pe care le făceau în comun ca și profesie. Și puteai să intri într-o breaslă ca și ucenic, iar apoi un maestru te învăța și după aceea, după câțiva ani, deveneai și tu un maestru la rândul tău și învățai pe alții, dădeai mai departe din tot ceea ce ai învățat. Și pentru că am crescut în România după comunism, n-am avut foarte multe modele de la cine să învățăm, așa că ne-am dat seama că, ok, poate e timpul să învățăm unii de la alții și să ne încurajăm, să ne provocăm, să fim o sursă de, de inspirație și, de asemenea, să avem curajul să fim autentici, vulnerabili, cu părțile bune, cu eșecurile, poate, din, din business și... Să ajutăm să ne provocăm unii pe alții, ca să putem să creștem atât din punct de vedere personal, profesional, cât și spiritual. Și astfel a început Guild. Asta nu e poză de la început, e, cred că poză de anul acesta. Acum e fain, după 5 ani de zile, în Cluj avem 5 astfel de grupuri, în care în fiecare grup sunt aproximativ 15 oameni. Um, atât în business, cât și în, în medicină. Loredana Lara a inițiat un grup în, cu doctori. Nu știu ce discute acolo, dar probabil că e interesant. Uh, și, de asemenea, Bogdan Băbălău a inițiat un grup în Oradia uh, anul trecut și ne-am dat seama de nevoia mare pe care oamenii o au să fie împreună cu alți oameni, să construiască comunități, să, creasc, să creeze relații de încredere și să aparțină la un grup care are principii, valori similare, în care spui o glumă și lumea chiar râde și se prinde despre ce glumă ai spus. E fain, e încurajator cumva, pentru că business în sine e destul de singuratic și poți să te trezești singur în business și ai nevoie totuși de oameni în jurul tău care să vorbească aceeași limbă, să te înțeleagă și care să poată să fie acolo lângă tine când, când ai nevoie. E bine, după ce tot am mâncat mult timp împreună, mi-am dat seama că poate ar fi fain să mai facem totuși și ceva. Dacă vrem schimbare pozitivă în societate și credem în lideri cu principii și valori, am zis, ok, poate ar fi fain să facem niște întâlniri. Așa a apărut ideea de Guild Talks, în care ne întâlnim la nivel de oraș, e o întâlnire probabil similară cum e întâlnirea asta, în care aducem invitați speciali, oameni care vorbesc din experiență proprie, oameni care cu adevărat împărtășesc principii și valori și care ne inspiră, ne provoacă și ne ajută să mergem la următorul nivel. Și astea sunt întâlniri care se întâmplă aproximativ trimestrial. Dar bineînțeles că ne place să ne și distrăm, așa că din când în când facem retreat și ieșim împreună, împreună cu familiile noastre, cu copiii, cu toată lumea, pentru că mi-am dat seama că în mediul de business totul e despre acel om, acel lider și toate întâlnirile sunt despre acel om care reușește, care e extraordinar și de succes, dar nu prea sunt contexte în care să mergem împreună cu familia. Așa că noi la Guild Retreats intenționat facem chestiuni împreună cu, cu familia. Um, și ne-am dat seama că pe, pe lângă toate grupurile astea și inițiativele care le avem, noi ca și oameni avem o nevoie esențială de, um, de Dumnezeu, în, în, în esență, de semnificație, să înțelegem foarte clar uh, care e povestea cu noi, de unde venim, încotro mergem, ce lăsăm în urma noastră și să facem tranziția asta de la uh, profit către semnificație, către contribuție. Și în uh, grupuri uh, uh, de genul acesta, cum e gil spiritual, în care am testat diferite uh, programe, precum uh, Story of God, povestea lui Dumnezeu, uh, sau cursul Alfa pentru oameni de afaceri. Uh, în astfel de contexte putem să ducem lucrurile la următorul nivel. După ce uh, poate în alte contexte am discutat despre business, aici discutăm specific despre partea spirituală. Și în sală sunt mulți oameni care au trecut prin astfel de, de programe în ultimii uh, doi ani. Și mă bucur așa de mult să vedem cum vieți se, transpo- se transformă, să vedem cum oameni uh, își găsesc uh, sensul, semnificația, împlinirea în uh, relația cu Dumnezeu. Pentru că businessul poate să fie interesant și o jucărie interesantă și o să ne aducă bani și o să ne aducă importanță și o să ne aducă semnificație, dar până la urmă fiecare dintre noi are nevoie să-și găsească bucuria, pacea, liniștea 
pe care numai Hristos ne le poate oferi. Și în astfel de grupuri ne dăm posibilitatea ca să povestim unii cu alții, să facem debate, să facem storytelling și să ne lăsăm cunoscuți, să fim cunoscuți și să ne încurajăm unii pe alții în călătoria pe care fiecare dintre noi o are în, în partea spirituală. Am apreciat foarte mult feedback-ul vostru și toți cei care sunteți interesați de cartea lui Wouter, o aveți aici pe masă, puteți să o luați. Cei care îl convingeți poate vă dau și un autograf, cine știe. Ne-am bucurat să fim împreună în seara asta. Vă dorim o seară bună. Numai bine! Thank mm-hmm. you.